Afternoon all, I hope you enjoyed your lunch and I'd just like to say welcome to Damien from MPC. Thank you. Hi everyone. So yeah, my name is Damien Fanyu, I'm an MPC stereographer. Um, so today we have a presentation for you. It's about 40, 45 minutes, sort of a sort of big overview of the, the, the terms and the concepts that are important for us in, in visual effects. So the way this is structured is we have a little bit of context just to kind of see why we're all here you know, now. Um, the basic glossary is the sort of term that you might encounter if you're starting stereo project or if you're in stereo project, uh, and then just detailing those a little bit. Uh, stereo techniques, what are the different ways that you have to make stereo movie? You know, we've talked a lot about conversions, native stereo, and the in-between. So, so we'll go a bit over what, what those means exactly. Um, then we talk a little bit about the hardware and the software, the things that are available to you, and the, the, also the projection, you know, the things that you have to know about that. And then a little bit of conclusion, and hopefully you have a bit of time for Q&A, and I'll be a little bit here if, if some people have specific questions. So why now? I mean, really, why now? It's a question that now a lot of you should sort of know, but you know, really what happened last year is you know, this changed a lot of the industry. A lot of people knew that 3D was going to be important, but no one really understood how much it was going to be until this movie really made a big hit at the box office. And you know, two point, almost $2.8 billion worldwide box office. That's sort of a really massive uh, achievement, especially if you look at the numbers that was there before, you know, the previous movie 13 years ago almost, and then already was like a, you know, a big giant movie, but they was really dwarfed all the other things. But what you can see is that it's, a, it's not really just Avatar. It's not just Avatar was a great movie and, and that was so much better than anything else. It's, is we see also the other two movies that I have at the bottom, they are, they are 3D movies, and what it just shows is sort of, sort of a enthusiasm, a, a kind of a, a, some people want to see 3D movie, and so they, they go to the cinema. It, it's easier to see these numbers and say, oh, so it's all about money, and then you know, the tickets are more expensive, that's why they're making more money. But if you, even if you just assume a ticket price of $15, which is generally you know, what you have to pay for a 3D movie, it's still you know, hundreds of millions of people that went to see just those three movies during the last 12 months. And so there is a real desire for people to see 3D content uh, at the cinema and then, and then in the homes later. Um, and so these trends continue. You know, we, we're seeing upcoming movies, actually, uh, you know, almost half of those are now uh, you know, been uh, theatrically released, and you, you might have seen some of them already. But there's still some to come. Pirates of the Caribbean, that NPC was involved, is coming out next month. We're kind of in the final uh, weeks of working on Harry Potter that's coming this summer, which is going to be a great 3D movie. And, and then some others, uh, you know, obviously the animated feature have been 3D movie for a long time, and they, they'll continue to be. Um, so that's, that's sort of the context, you know, why, why we're all here today. So let, let's talk a little bit about the glossary. What's our term? What are the worlds, the new worlds, you know, the buzzword that you might hear that, that's sort of new compared to what you used to know last year? Um, so this one is, is sort of almost the most important term for 3D movie making, you know, the interocular distance. What it is, is simply, it's really easy to understand, it's the distance between the two cameras. You're filming 3D, so you're replicating what your binocular vision is doing. You're, you're creating two images slightly different for each eyes, and that will create, create this perception of 3D. And the distance at which you set those two cameras, those two acquisition medium, is the interocular distance. Um, for reference, the human eyes is about you know, 6.5 centimeters, 6.4, um, and then 2.5 inch, depending which metrics you, you kind of like. Um, setting this, as we discussed, that sets the depth intensity. You know, if you imagine that 6.5 is the human eyes and a mono camera is two cameras on top of each other in a way, that's zero 3D. And then in between, as you take the camera further away from each other, you're increasing the intensity of 3D. So really, it's like you're dialing. You know, the more I.O., the more 3D will be perceived. It's this side on set, you know, you're filming, so you have to set those two cameras at a certain distance. And then you, it's really hard to change. Really, you're, you're creating an offset into every single pixel of your picture that's different for everyone. And it, it's not something that you can really easily change after. If, if you don't want to change, th there is some rare ways that you can do it. But overall, you're deciding that on set. So that's quite a commitment. Um, so let's talk a little bit about those cameras, because they're really important. Um, so there's two, there's two types of camera, two types of, of, of setting them up, or at least two primary types. Um, there's the parallel camera where, as the name implies, the two cameras are set on a parallel axis, you know, as described in these graphics. They're both looking toward the subject at exactly the same sort of angle. Um, and then 
the convergence, we'll discuss a little bit what's happened, what's mean the convergence, but it's, you know, where the, the sort of the two eyes meet, you know, if you think about where your, your, your vision is. That has to be done in post. Because they are parallel, they never really cross those cameras, so there is no convergence when you film. You can apply this convergence in post-production, and that's, that's what we do uh, in film. Um, you need overscan. What do you need overscan for is because when you apply convergence, you take those two pictures and you, you, you apply a, a small transform. You spread them across a little bit to kind of adjust the plane of convergence. Um, and then for that, you have to have extra room on your images um, to, to make sure that as you slide them, there is information there. You know, otherwise, you're going to get black bands or things like this. It's not really a problem with modern camera. We, we all do those 3D movies using you know, Epic or uh, other camera which have five or 4K sensors. And we already just do a crop section in there. So we make sure that we take a portion of the sensor which is wider than our 2K final. So we have room to apply this convergence. Um, so that's one type of camera. And then you know, I used to do this talk and say, well, you know, that's the one that you'll see more and more in the future. And actually, it seemed that you know, the resistance is strong on the, on the believer that converts camera are better. Because on the project that MPC is involved this year, stereo projects about you know, between five and six, depending on how you count, um, it's almost a split. You know, we're doing half of full parallel shoot. And there's still you know, stereographer out there that really believe that convergence is a slightly better way to film. Um, so, when you do converge, you're adding a s another element of, of setting up in your camera. You are actually already towing in your camera. You, you kind of angle them a little bit toward each other, so they actually cross at a certain distance. That will be your convergence point. You know, you want the, the, the screen objects to be this character, so you point the camera toward these objects. Um, so it, it, it's one more thing that you have to decide on set, and you know, with set being what they are, it's, it's always difficult to have to decide more things there. And also, it introduced some little artifacts on the surrounding of the picture. Um, it, it is still, you know, it's 50-50. You know, some, some say that this is better, so that's why they pay the cost of the slightly more difficult filming and the artifacts. Um, so what, what does those two cameras do? What, why do we see 3D at the end? You know, we have two pictures, but why, why do we see 3D? Is because on these two pictures, every object is uh, at slightly different position. You can really kind of visualize that easily if you just think on the cinema when you remove your glasses. You know, you see double everything. Actually, you don't see double everything. You see double some things, and some things are rather sharp, you know, and so you can gauge how much separation is between the object by seeing how much double imaging you see. Um, and then here we see the two types of parallaxes. You have the positive parallax, which is when the left, the object on your left eye and the same object viewed from your left or right eye goes from left to right, so in the same direction than your eyes. You know, so that's this first column you know, where you have the red and blue in the right order. And that's positive parallax. What you're viewing is you're looking through a window and your eyes are looking at some object in a far distance. So you're seeing positive mean you know, behind the screen. And then negative parallax is when those two objects are reversed. You know, if you look on the left and then you look on the right, they seem to go in the opposite direction. And so that's what happens on this graphic on the right hand side is your eyes, they're sort of crossing before they go to the screen. It's a bit like I put my finger in front of my face and I look at my finger and then I see double, you know, in that direction. Um, in general, we count that in pixel. You know, in film industry, everything is digital. For us, it's pixel. But you also hear it sometimes as percentage. You know, it's a percentage of the full width because it's also depending on, you know, how big you're projecting and some such sort of things. On, on TV, for example, Sky TV, they, they reference their positive and negative parallax that they like in percent rather than in pixel. Um, so now an interesting uh, parameter about this, this convergence is what parallax. So we've seen two parallax, positive behind the screen, negative in front of the screen. So there is this one interesting parallax, which is the zero parallax, what happens in between, you know? And so that's, that's really important one because that's, that's a very strong creative uh, tool. You know, that's where you're setting the boundaries of the, the screen where the, the viewer is in the cinema and they see things which are coming at them that's entering the cinema and they see things through a window, the windows through the world where they're visualizing this open world. And so the boundaries is the one that the stereographer or you as creative, you have to decide. And that's where both objects look in the same position in the left and the right eye. Yeah? So I get some more graphics here that illustrate, you know, in this first column, everything is in front of the screen, you know, and maybe that's a roller coaster ride or it has to be really like intense in your face. 
The one in the middle, actually, the character is in front of the screen, but the house is behind, so we're doing sort of a midway approach. And on this last uh, column at the bottom, the screen is on the character and everything is behind it, you know, which is more what you see in theatrical these days. It's played like Avatar or some other movie that will come out soon. It, it's played very much like a window through the world uh, kind of thing, really much less in your face, really. Um, well, that's just what we talked about. So just recap, I mean, this, this is really important, you know, as first is the reason why we see 3D, why it works, and then as creatives, as technical people, it's, this is a really, that's what we're creating. We're creating parallax in our picture, which means that, you know, we're uh, we gonna present those, those pictures as 3D. So negative parallax, left and right are flipped, you know, that's why we call it negative, and then you cross your eyes before the screen. Zero parallax, Left and right eye see the same thing. There is no distance between those two images. If you do left, right, the object doesn't move. And so that's mono, you know, that's what's on the screen. That's the zero parallax. If you have positive parallax, left to right, your eyes see left to right, you're looking through a glass window at some object which is in a further away distance, you know, away distance. And then this sort of maximum parallax is like, if your eyes are looking completely straight, you know, then they're assuming they're looking at the sun or the sky, you know, something very far, it's the infinity. Um, so I'll just show a little bit example on, on some 3D software, what, what that would look like in, in practice sometimes. It helps people visualizing a little bit uh, what we're talking about. So I've got here, here two, two views in, in Maya 2011. Uh, one view of anaglyph of the world which is on the right hand side, which is, you know, those two camera, in that case parallel camera, with a little cube on the left hand side, the MPC logo in the middle, and then three little sphere that goes further away in the distance. And so what we see in the anaglyph is, you know, if you notice at this moment they are parallel camera, so there is no convergence. Everything, all the red and cyan are on the same side. Everything will be in negative parallax. Actually, I can show you a zoomed out version. Um, so the further object has no parallax. The two sphere look the same because when you look at something with parallel camera, very far, the distance between those two cameras become irrelevant compared to the distance to the object. So they're basically seeing the same thing. If I walk one meter and I look at the sky, it hasn't moved, or the sun, you know, those, those, those distance doesn't matter. But as they came closer to me, their relative, you know, this distance become relevant between the distance between we and them, and so they're increasing parallax. But that's not really gonna be a great 3D experience, you know, if we went to activate 3D on that, that wouldn't really work for everyone. Um, so what we do is we adjust this convergence plane. Um, and so here is again, you know, in Maya, you have those tools where you can adjust the film offset and then you can visualize the 3D plane, which is the, the place where the, the, the screen will be perceived by the viewer. And now suddenly we see that this cube, which is on the left hand side, will be perceived before the screen. And if you look at it carefully, you can see that on the left hand side, you have cyan and on the right hand side, you have red, you know, this anaglyph. The MPC logo, doesn't pretty much look, it has no cyan or red, you know, it's the same image on both sides, so it's on the zero parallax plane, you know, that's how it's described on the right hand side. And then those spheres that we've placed, like, kind of conveniently going further away from each other, they have increasing positive parallax, you know, you see now that the cyan is on the right hand side and the red, and so those objects will be perceived to be going away into the world, you know, in the 3D worlds that we're opening. Um, so now that's the same image that we've seen, but without the, the the, the screen, so again, and I've got a little animation, you know, just so we see if, is that launched? Oh, left here. Um, so as you see, as this cube goes in front and behind the screen plane, the cyan and yellows change, you know, the parallax will change, and then th this will be your, your sort of 3D depth cues, and the logo himself doesn't move. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a recap, really, in a bit. It's really important, the parallax is, you know, the most important tool that you have at your disposal when you're doing 3D uh, picture. And a lot of time, if you know how to read parallax, you can, you can see 3D in your head or you can debug 3D or you can fix 3D just on a normal monitor. You know, I see that every day I sit on a compositor desk and I look at his picture and I do left, right, and I tell him, here is wrong, fix that, move that 10 pixel away, and then you'll be good. And we don't really have to see a 3D monitor to get those judgments. You, you just have to, to train yourself to learn uh, to read that information. Um, we've discussed a little bit that you can, you know, you have sort of a limit where your eyes can sort of, they look straight and that's, you know, about right. You know, your eyes are really good at crossing to look at very close objects. They actually, they can actually do that, you know, contrary to what some people might think. But it's not very comfortable and our eyes are not really trained for that. And so that could lead to serious eye strain. And that's why in the past, you know, when, when we didn't have the good techniques to do the 3D movie, 
uh, people would think 3D was a bit sickening and it would make them dizzy because if you don't control the 3D parameter correctly, then you're not presenting something that's kind of pleasant to watch. The brains get fatigued and the eyes get fatigued and then the, the experience is not really great. So let's talk a little bit about those camera rigs, you know, because they, they're important. I've just mentioned a couple of names here, but those, those change quickly. Those are sort of the historic creator, you know, Pace uh, did create the first rigs that they use with Cameron before Avatar, actually another 3D production. And for Avatar, they had a special one that they built together. Uh, there is now other rigs, really, you know, good rigs that you can find, you know, either built by London company or world company. Uh, but what's interesting to all those rigs um, is that the second camera, you know, the slave camera, we call it, it goes through a mirror. It, <clears throat> it goes through or it, it bounces on a mirror. Sometimes you hear it referred as beam splitter. Ultimately, it's this half tinted mirror, you know. One side you see through, one side it reflects a little bit like you see on CSI. Um, and so, well, why would you do that? You know, you think, well, that's not really convenient. Mirrors get dirty and everything. And if you, if you think about all this thing that we've talked about before is, well, we said, you know, the, the eyes is 6.5 centimeters. And that's already really close. And in practice, uh, when you do a stereo movie, you actually have to keep your IO, your interocular distance between one, one centimeters to eight centimeters. You have some cases where you go, you know, below that value and above uh, the eight, but that will be a good range, you know, 80% or 90% of the shots that we're doing on the new Harry Potter, they're within that range for sure. Uh, and so now you're saying, okay, let's visualize it. We have those two camera and they're quite big, you know, digital camera have small bodies, but still they have quite big lens. How are you gonna fit two of those camera one centimeter apart so you can film in 3D? Um, and so that's where the mirror comes in. So on the left-hand side, it's, it's not a pace rig, but it's a similar rig. And so what you do to get that thing is you just take your two camera and then you make one at a 90 degree angle, generally the slave one, and then they, this in the middle of this little box that's trying to prevent the reflection, there is a 45 degree angle half tinted mirror or those beam splitter. So the camera that's horizontal, the master camera, is just seeing through, you know, it's on the other glass tinted of CSI, and it, it sees the world as it is, you know, slightly tinted, but not too much. And the camera, which is on the other side, you know, that's the bad, the bad guy, he just sees reflection. So the reflection, and then he sees the world through the reflection. And what it means is that once you have this setup, you can get the two cameras to be on top of each other, virtually, because their axis of filming, you know, one camera bounce on the other, so you can get your I.O. to reduce all the way down to zero. You don't really do that, otherwise you just shoot with a single camera, but at least you can start from a very small value and open up or something like this, you know. Those are fully motorized, so they can animate I.O. We're trying to minimize the amount of things they're doing, because in visual effects it gets complicated, but in some cases it's useful. Um, and then even if they have convergence, they're actually motorizing the convergence so they can adjust that. And in general, if they're shooting converge, they often have to animate the convergence. Um, and we see the, the, the other camera doesn't have to be necessarily uh, vertical from the top down. It's really, that's practical when you have something on a crane or something you know, that's put down. If you're carrying like James Cameron on the right hand side, it's easier to have the slave camera going up because it's, you know, it's a, as an L shape, it's an easier thing to kind of carry on your shoulder. And so that's one of these constructs that he has there filming uh, some shot in Avatar. And then you have this one in the middle, and I, I put there because that's, that's the general sort of image, naive image that people would have. Okay, 3D camera, they look like this, you know. And then so there are some that look like this, and in which case that's possible. And we discussed, we wouldn't be able to film, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean with this camera because we wouldn't be able to get the camera close enough to shoot most of the thing that we have to. But if you look at the surrounding of this camera, it gives you a hint of what, what this is useful for. When you film live events and also large scale events, you have two things that you have to kind of take care for. You, you have to have a big IO because we said the IO is the intensity of 3D and if things are very far, the distance between the camera becomes irrelevant. So if you're shooting a football game from the top of the stadium with five centimeters interocular, it's gonna be like shooting with a mono camera. There's gonna be very little disparity and your picture is gonna be looking very flat. So what you do, you have to spread your camera more to exaggerate. It tends to miniaturize a little bit the world because your brain is used to a certain size 3D and when you see more 3D, you assume that he is a giant seeing a small thing. You know, it's that you're, you're kind of projecting yourself to what you're seeing. But, but at least you see 3D, you know, no one wants to buy a 3D TV to watch a football game that looks flat. So. Um, and the other things that that really helps is you're doing live retransmission. And we'll see that with beam splitter or mirror or, you know, kind of 
square week in general, you, you have a lot of post-production, you have a lot of cleanups, you have a lot of things that you have to fix in post and that takes a lot of time and that's not really convenient for real-time retransmission. So they have much less problem in normal side-by-side uh, -side camera. So I generally like to kind of conclude the sort of vocabulary uh, by these two terms which are, they're not about the technique of 3D or how you, know, you have to set your camera, or how technically challenging it is. It's more about the creativity of the tool. And because it's easy to kind of just think, oh, 3D is just a technical achievement, it's just here to make an extra buck and you know, bring people to the cinema. And actually, a lot of people have been really invested in 3D for the creativity and the sort of storytelling ad advantage that it brings. And you know, a lot of people now coming to, to this uh, too. And so when James Cameron does Avatar, he, he takes the 3D as part of his storytelling experience and he, he cares for that. So there's two terms that are important in that sense is the depth budget and the depth scripts. So the depth budget is sort of, you know, how much 3D you want to use in your movie. If you're doing the new Hugo Cabaret movie and you're doing sort of a, you know, polar piece kind of thing, you want to be subtle. You know, it's about bringing this extra le level of proximity with your actor, nothing more, not distracting from the, the main story plot. But if you're doing Pyrena 3D, you're doing an entertainment piece. It's about actions, it's about in your face and people feeling, wow, I went to see this movie and it was great 3D. And so your budget, you know, the amount of 3D you want to use in your movie is different. And actually, here I give the sort of general idea about a, a movie, but in a sequence of a movie, some of the sequence will be intense 3D and some of the sequence dialogue and sort of, you know, sadness, you're, you're dialing down the 3D effects to kind of bring uh, your, your the, the right effect. Um, and then the depth script is sort of, well, once you have this budget, and again, we say it's a budget per, you know, the movie and also per sequence, then you have to line it up into the, 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 your, your scripts in very much the same way that you do with music. You know, music is not, oh, it does boom, boom, boom until the end. It's sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it ramp ups and down with the story to really connect you with what you're trying to kind of experience. And so with 3D is the same and it has an added advantage that it would be very hard for your eyes and your brain to be looking at intense 3D for another two hours. You know, you have to have moments where things get softer and simpler because your brain needs to relax a little bit. Your eyes need to get a little bit of peace in between. So you use those spikes and, and, and dips to get your brain to accept the 3D movie for two hours and also to make sure that you use the 3D at the moment where it punch and it gives something extra to your story. So what are those techniques? You know, we've discussed a little bit about the vocabulary, the terms, but there's still different ways that you can do 3D movie. And you know, there was prime focus this morning. They, they talk about one way, and I'll just describe it quickly here. We're saying, you know, um, here we're seeing James Cameron. That's native, what we call native stereo. You know, it's filmed in 3D. It's all filmed in 3D from the beginning. And then you have this interesting sort of hybrid uh, with Alice in Wonderland, which I call mixed stereo, and then we'll see in detail where, where those two worlds meet to do something special as well. So first I'll talk about native, you know, so Pirates of the Caribbean was native stereo, it was, you know, so what, what do we mean by native, you know, so it was filmed with a stereo camera, the, the one that we've just discussed, you know, it's acquired natively using stereo equipment, that's, that's why it's native. Um, so visual effects house, we get two plates, you know, one for the left eye and one for the right eye, we do much move, on each eye, you know, two independent camera, they, they're gonna be the same a little bit, but they're gonna be enough decrepancy that you have to match move both eyes independently. Um, and then we have two camera, we do two CG render of everything. So we have sort of native stereo render of our CG element as well. We comp in stereo, you know, using modern compositing software and LMPC we use Nuke pretty monthly, but you have other ones that support now stereo. Um, you, you're, you're not compositing one time your left eye and one time your right eye, you're compositing your left eye, right eye pair. And then most of the operation, a grade, a little thing here and there, they work for both eyes. Sometimes you have to split your view and apply a little patch on one eye and not on the other. Or if you do roto, you have to make sure that you're you know, offsetting it correctly to, to, to match. But ultimately you're comping once in stereo. Um, and so generally people think, well, that's simple. You know, why are there any other techniques? You, know, that's, you film in stereo, you render in stereo, you comp in stereo, done, you have a great movie. But th there are some complications, obviously. You know? And so the main, the main complication that, uh, for me is really that's where it all started. You have two cameras, you have two 
separate acquisition uh, apparatus, and they, they, they obviously match much better than those two uh, in real life. But ultimately, they're still different. They're on different body, they record at different rates, they have different lengths. We're trying to get really matching lengths, you know, that would be exactly the same property, but ultimately, you know, nothing is in the real world is exactly mathematically exact. So you have the problem that you have those two rigs, two different camera. Then you have the mirror. You know, we say we have to film with this mirror, 45 degree angle. And so this mirror creates some color collaboration. You know, mirror has some funny property with light and it's sometimes you have some, you know, this is a simulated disparity, but you would have difference in tints. You also have small local distortion. A mirror is not a perfectly pristine planar object. It has small distortion. With times, and you use this rig many hours during the day, sometimes, you know, 24 hours during the day, it'll get some little, little, little warps that will show in your picture as little local dis deformity. And then you can get dust, you know, dust, or we, on part of the Caribbean, we film a lot at sea. Well, you film at sea, there is little speckles. Those get protected, they're in cage, everything. You always get the occasional little dust or water damage that you have to then repair on one of the eyes. Then there is alignment. So those two camera, they are fixed on those body quite rigidly and you know, those are really kind of fine-tuned uh, rigs and they've been built you know, to, to sustain those type of problems. But still, again, in the real world, nothing is never mathematically exact. And so you have small misalignments on your picture. So in order to experience great 3D at the cinema, and you know, that's why you can do it today and you couldn't 20 or 30 years ago, you have to have perfectly aligned left and right eye. You know? When you do a left and right blink, you need to see your picture just going from left to right at certain different amount of intensity, those parallax that we discussed before. But what you don't want to see is, you don't want to see any color changes, you know, and then that's why we have to fix the color disparity. And you also don't want to have anything that goes as a little bit up and down because your brain is, as, is horizontal. Your eyes are looking like this and it expects the only change between each eye is to be an horizontal change. And so, misalignments cause trouble and we have to rectify them in post-production and that's a kind of complex problem. Um, there is tool, you know, you can use ocular and some other techniques, but still, it's one more thing that you have to do to process your, uh, your input rate. So much of what we do in visual effects is about taking one picture and making it something different. It's about filming something with a big green screen and replacing it with some, you know, crazy landscape or something. And so we have to do a lot of roto. We roto every single bit, we roto character so we can play CG element behind, we roto edges so we can extend it with digital sets. So suddenly we have two images, slightly different, you know, they're not exactly the same, they're not just offset by a little bit, they have small local distortions. So we have to do two roto. You can get some help from the software but you still have to do more work. Paint, hey, and wire removal, track removal, a lot of things is about cleaning the plate for things they couldn't remove on set when they're filming. We have to paint them out. Well, now we have to paint them out twice. And if it wasn't enough, what you have to do is, as we say, you have to have those two pictures that are perfectly identical apart from those horizontal offset. So you can't just go on the right eye and paint something that looks cool and then go on the left eye and paint something that looks cool and say, hey, that's gonna be nice because those two things that look cool, they have to look exactly the same. So generally, you have to paint one eye and then you have to use projection to do the other eye exactly the same but with the offset. But then it means that you have to have you know, your camera ready, you have to have some geometry to project onto. So it creates more interdependency between your tasks and things that used to be independent and could be done at different times now have to happen sequentially, increasing the complexity of, of the general work. Um, then you have the bags of tricks, you know, the compositor, they need to be able to say, yeah, I'll fix that in comp, I'll put an element here, I'll bring some dust here, I'll put a little splash and it'll be all perfect. Well, some of those tricks don't work anymore because in 3D it will show that this little patch is a card and it will not be in the right place or it will not have the roundness that it needs to have. So some of the tricks go away. What we found this year while we were working on those multiple projects is actually a lot of tricks still apply that we thought would not work anymore. And you, you can still get away by doing a lot of compositing tricks. And you can also get away by doing new tricks that don't really work in 2D. But in 3D, because you have the help of the third dimension, there is things that you don't have to worry so much anymore that you have to. And in general, it's, it's an increase complexity in the pipeline, you know, and, and when you do visual effects and you do hundreds of shots in, in a matter of months, 
the pipeline is really a critical piece of, of the, uh, the puzzle and anything that makes it harder to maneuver, anything that makes it easier to break is something that we have to look out really carefully. So native stereo is not simple. It's very complicated, it's costly on set, it's costly in visual effects, and that's why, you know, that's why there is a good will for a lot of people to find alternate solutions and see what's possible to be doing differently. So, dimensionalize. I mean, some of you might have been to the, the talk this morning from Prime Focus, so you know, that, that's what they do. They convert 2D to 3D. And we call it DN sometimes internally at MPC just because that's a long term to make, and I think some company patent the term also, so it's always a bit complicated. Uh, but Narnia, you know, which we see that, was dimensionalized, and then Potter 7B, the, the part two, the one that comes in the summer, is also dimensionalized. Um, it's actually turning out to be a really great movie, I think. Um, but, so what does it mean, dimensionalized? So it's filmed with regular camera, mono camera, a single camera for the standard way, you know, the way that it was done before, which remove all these problems of uh, having to worry about the rig, the fact that they're heavier, the fact that they have mirror, the fact that there are they are few of them, they're very expensive. So that's great, there's a big plus here. Visual effects get one plate, you know, great for us, we're used to getting one plate, we're used to doing only one roto, only one everything. Um, CG is rendered mostly in mono, you know, we have one plate, one camera, we do CG in mono. I say mostly because both in, uh, in uh, Potter and before that in Narnia, we tend to do full CG shots in stereo because you know, no one wants to dimensionalize a full CG shot when everything is there just to be re-rendered. Um, and in some cases, and it's the case we'll talk a little bit about after in mixed stereo, and then that's the case for Potter, we actually do about 80 shots where we, we are doing the 3D version internally at MPC, and so we do mixed stereo. We re-render re re all the CG native, and so we get the good you know, fire and one effects and stuff like this. Um, but ultimately, the visual effects house, they are not doing the 3D version of the movie, they are doing the 2D version of the movie, and they deliver a lot of assets to the post-dimensionalization vendors. Uh, we're talking about mats, VED passes, and that's for you know, vendors that are doing the sort of same technique as prime focus, depth grading or you know, depth creation. And then some other vendors are doing geometry approach, which is about you know, projection, camera and projection. And for those, we often also provide them uh, cache sequence of files and camera when we have them just to make sure that the, the work is, is done in a faster way. But ultimately, post-conversion studio are doing the movie. They are converting the two odd thousand shots um, and they're doing it with, with those techniques. The process lasts between two to four months. Ultimately, it's not a lot of time. You know, for a movie like Star Wars, they are doing actually the conversion in almost 12 months because they have the luxury that the movie is finished, they decide when it's gonna come out in 3D, so they have the luxury of time. For sort of theatrical release, uh, like Harry Potter or Narnia, you have this compressed period of time between the moment the visual effects starts kind of tailing off and the moment it goes in the cinema, and that's actually a very compressed time nowadays. And so they try, they start on, or they start, sorry, they start on the drama shot early, you know, the one without visual effects. But for visual effects shots, they have to wait until we have final the shots, or at least mostly final the shot, they can start bits of both. But it is quite a compressed schedule, making it quite an, uh, it's quite a big undertaking. We're talking about, you know, thousands of people, uh, you know, prime focus, I know, as maybe over a thousand people in India doing a lot of the roto and, and um, and prep for those things. So mixed stereo, and why, where mixed stereo is really interesting. So there is a really great project that was done in mixed stereo that just came out last year. It's Alice in Wonderland, and it's always I use this project because I think it's really a good example of why mixed stereo is a great way to go. Is Tim Burton when he decided to make Alice in Wonderland, you know, that was before Avatar. He already knew he wanted to make a 3D movie. That was a conscious choice. He didn't decide at the last minute. He said, "I want to do a 3D movie." And he had, you know, Tim Burton's budget, you know, big budget. He decided what he wanted to do. He went for mixed stereo, and we'll see what it is, you know, conversion, conversion and, and, and 3D, because he thought it gave him the most creative freedom in terms of doing his movie like he liked, you know, because in mixed stereo, you're filming with regular camera. So Tim Burton wanted to be doing his movie with his camera move, his handle camera, something that he understands and controls. You're giving visual effects one plate, you know, and then on those shots, there was a lot of green screen and stuff like this. It was much easier to just get one. But you're delivering in stereo, and then, you know, Sony Image Work did most of the visual effects for this movie. They are doing the 3D conversion of the plate internally, and they're delivering a 3D version. So why, why this is really great? Well, 
they have to do the DN work, but the, the part which is really important is they do all the CG, and as a movie like Alice in Wonderland, you know, there was a lot of virtual environment. They do all the CG in native stereo, so you get the full on real 3D experience of all the backgrounds. And then they do the compositing in stereo, so when you had uh, dust and smoke elements and layers, everything is still broken down into an open 3D world, so if you're just re-rendering from a slightly different camera, you get the full transparency layout, the things which is really hard to do in post-conversion. And it's sort of, it's not in this slide here, but it, it gives you also the ability to spread your work away from those two to four months because you are the visual effects vendors, you are doing your green screen really early, you know that you need roto uh, animation for those characters because they're casting shadow on the virtual environment, they're receiving shadow from the virtual character. So you're already building a lot of this work progressively as you build your visual effects shots, so you're actually having a much wider uh, kind of time frame for your project and you can, you can afford to do a better work. Um, Post-conversion studio, they've done some shots in Alice in Wonderland, they, they did some of the drama shots, you know, because it's a lot of shots for just one studio to do, so they, they did some of the drama shots. And then actually I, I placed Harry Potter in the, the first category, in the middle category, but in Harry Potter, a lot of the shots are mixed stereo. You know, we're doing a bunch of mixed stereo, uh, double negatives, and, and a lot of the other vendors are taking some of the shots where there is big 3D moments, you know, CG moments, and those ones are done in native stereo with a little bit of conversion, done by the studio of the plates. And then the, the post-conversion house, they do the sort of in-between drama shots and low visual effects shots. Um, and so everyone has a bit more time to do a really good work, and, and we think, you know, when you see Harry Potter this summer in the cinema, you, you'll see that it's actually a very good way and it, it, it competes well with what native stereo can do. So, we're still about 10 minutes in, so we just talk a little bit about the hardware and the software. I'll get a couple of interesting slides about the projection. You know, sometimes it, it's a bit magical, it's sort of easier to understand how active shutter works, but how real the end um, Dolby works is always a little bit more sort of obscure, so I've got a little run, you know, who's the real D, who's Dolby? In, in the UK, you pretty much get uh, real D everywhere, but Dolby still gets some cinema in, in Leicester Square and stuff like this, so you could have experienced those glasses uh, one time. So, how does it work? So you have, you know, my daughter's favorite character, Woody, left and right image, two different, slightly different images that we've created before. They get interleaved, actually, at, you know, three shots, three times each frame per shot, so in, you know, six, uh, six shots. Um, and they go into this screen, it's called the Z screen. It's, this screen is gonna take each image and it's gonna polarize them. The light has these weird properties where it either spin in one direction or in the other. So this Z screen is sort of blocking the light to only polarize the left, the right eye with one spin and the right eye with the other spin. And then you've got those real D glasses, you know, that the, the you get at the cinema and they have light blockers where they block the polarized one-way light and then polarize all the other way light. And so your eyes see left eye, right eye see right image, left eye see right image. So apart from the spinning light thingy, that's, you know, that's just science, but it's sort of easier to understand. The other one is a bit more mystical. It's like Dolby, they're using a completely different technique at the end. You know, it's a very sort of different approach. You'd think they would be similar, but it's completely different. And so they use this diacroic filter. I, I gave up on giving, saying it properly. But you have, again, similar principle in terms of the projection, right and left, and they just get interleaved and shot in, in sequence several times each per frame. They go through this little filter, you know, it's not necessarily exactly like this in real world, but this is like this sort of spinning wheel that split the light in two. And then so the light has this property where he has sort of wavelengths and then some wavelengths are the blues and some wavelengths the green and some wavelengths the red. And what the, the, this filter does is it spread the light and it makes sure that the, the right eye is only on the sort of low bound of this uh, frequency. So the, the, the low blue, the low yellow, uh, the yellow, low green and low red. And then same for the other eye, you know, it's, that's the part that looks a bit magical. And then you have those glasses somehow does the reverse effect where they only block the high frequency bounds of those lights and they just make sure that each of your eyes is only seeing the right uh, image and then that's what creates the, the 3D uh, effects. And obviously active shutter, it's simpler. The left eye gets projected properly and then your right eye gets shut down. So this one is sort of easy to understand. You know, you just do this really quickly basically. So workstation. Um, 
There's actually a couple of workstation solutions. This one on the right hand side is the one that we use at NMPC at the moment, and we've been really happy with it. It's called three, True 3DI. They have 24 inch monitor. That's, that's this one that you're seeing. They also have a 40 inch monitor, which is a quite bulky. Uh, and they have lower size one that you can use on set, you know, if you're filming on set. They have two DVI input, and the way they work is quite interesting. And if you follow, it's very similar to the way a camera works, except it's flipped. You have two screens, you know, one screen at the top and one screen at the back, and a 45 degree angle, half tinted mirror kind of thing. And then you, lo you look at those through polarized glasses. They're linearly polarized rather than circularly, but it's the same principle than what we just saw. And then so your eyes, your, you know, your left eye sees screen one and your right eye sees screen two. What they're great for is you, you get, a first you get full resolution, because obviously you see each screen completely, and you get no flickering, because there's no flickering going on. It's very much the similar experience that you see on the real D, uh, actually potentially even better. Um, the, the other solution is active shutters. Uh, you know, NVIDIA, they, they do a solution. You can talk here, they, they, they could probably show you. They have a good solution, uh, the 3D Vision and 3D Vision Pro, uh, depending on the sort of what type of model you want. They have really high frequency LCD monitor that shutter left and right. And they work with Maya and Nuke, and so they're quite practical. We, we actually have one in evaluation at the moment to potentially spread onto our uh, floor. Uh, and there is some other mo 3D monitor which are polarized, a bit like the TV, but for computer. Um, they, they have some side effects. That means we don't use them. But um, Anaglyph, you can use Anaglyph for some tests. In general, I, I don't recommend Compositor to use Anaglyph a lot because after that you're trying to do your shot grading and it turns all red or blue and it's, you think you've done a great job. So general Anaglyph for small tests, but better to learn how to read the parallax. That's the ultimate tool. Anaglyph glasses, they're a gimmick and they really just make your eyes go funny. Um, TV, I'll just have this slide here. There's you know really two types of TV that you can use. We don't use them in film because they're not really part of our pipeline or deliverable, but they use them in commercial. We have a big um, commercial department at NPC. And they because their clients, you know, is TV related, you know, Sky TV, they've done a, the identity for Sky TV 3D, sort of a 360. And they, they obviously present it on TV because that's the ultimate, the, the final uh, medium. So you have two types, polarized, which is similar to what RealD does, but they are half resolution. So one line, uh, one eye, one line, the other. It's a bit like interlaced. And then you have Sony and Samsung that prefer active shutter, which is a bit like the NVIDIA solution. Uh, really high refresh rate with uh, blinking glasses. And they, they do a little bit of uh, strobing. N new ones get better, but we, we don't use them too much in film, so I won't comment. Next, we want glasses anyway. We just don't want to get rid of them. There are some autostereoscopic auto -stereoscopic display that are coming. Um, they still have some issue relating to sort of definitions and quality of the image. But the idea is that you, rather than having two views, you're doing a sort of a fan of views that are all sort of intermediates. And your eyes, based on the angle, they are seeing. Uh, the, the sort of the right angle. And what's nice about the auto stereoscopic, if, if you move your head ever so slightly, you get sort of a sort of a rounding effect as if you were moving on some sort of more 3D object. They, they definitely have some resolution and quality uh, problem at the moment, but you know, this technology is evolving quickly and I think they're working really hard to get rid of the glasses. Um, the software, you know, you have talks here with Autodesk, they talk about Maya. Uh, I said 2011 here because that's our current active version, but obviously 2012 is probably even better. We're using Nuke as a really good 3D uh, frame cycler, silhouette equalizer. Also RV, you know, is uh, really good for um, a stereo playback. It's a small company spin-off from uh, the guys working at ILM and they have a really good player there. We, we're using that a lot in, in production. Uh, ultimately, a lot of this software is ready for 3D a while ago because of the animated feature. The animated feature, I've not waited for Avatar to make 3D movie. They've been doing 3D movie for you know, five years or something. So those software company have been pushed a long time ago to kind of implement software, 3D support in their software. So exciting times. I mean, I hope you, know, you, you felt that I, at least I was excited, and I hope you are too. And if you're here, it's in some sense, you're excited. It's, it's for two reasons. I mean, I, I think this is a great industry because it's moving very rapidly and every couple of years we have to learn new things and we discover new technology, new techniques. And as, as a daily life, it's nice to, for your work to evolve and change. And also, if we work in this industry and we, we, 
we like to present words, or we like to present ideas, or we like to present films to, to people to get them into stories. And I think you know, we've all realized when we went to see a good 3D movie that if it's used properly and if it's done well, it's one more thing that gets you into this world. It's one more thing that makes you meet with the Navi, or it's one more thing that will make you feel the end battle of uh, Potter completely fantastic. And I think that's really exciting for me. And that's it for me today. Um, I'll probably have a little bit of time for some questions if you guys have some. Some questions? Don't be shy, we're not many. That was all clear? Oh, oh yeah. Does this make any difference to your set of views if not the distance, if it's basically viewed on the cinema or the television? Yes, so actually I'm just playing with the microphone. Um, so the interocular is actually setting the intensity of parallax. Right? The more interocular, the more parallax. And as we see, there is sort of a limit for your eyes where if your eyes have to look straight, that's kind of the limit of difference they'd want to see on some picture. So if you're projecting the same image on a giant screen where you're sitting just here, those images will be spread more than your eyes could really care to, to watch. And so um, I think uh, it's about, it's also it's depending on the distance at which you watch. So you know, if you're in the 10 foot experience, like big 3D TV, it's not quite as smaller as a cinema because in cinema you're quite further removed. But still, in general, I think the general kind of consensus is the TV should be twice as much. You know, you go into 50 pixel uh, disparity at the background, 1.5, 2%, while in cinema, it's often dialed down more to the 1, 1.5% maximum. So yes, it does make a difference. And um, at the moment, you know, because you don't do a movie twice, one for TV, Blu-ray, 3D, and one for cinema, we're sort of trying to find the, the compromise, but if there is direct DVD Blu-ray uh, creation, you know, for TVs or, or things, they will tend to be bigger uh, I.O. and they will not necessarily be great to watch on the big screen. Yeah? Yes, uh, definitely. You, if it's film converged, you really need to reshoot all your 3D with the same camera parameter. I mean, in, in parallel, you can get away with more because parallel doesn't introduce any of this keystoning or distortion. So that's why, you know, if we have a choice in visual effects, we rather parallel because it's, it makes the whole pipeline a bit clearer and easier to kind of change at the last moment. But if you should converge, you definitely would want to try to replicate those exact camera inside your 3D environment and shoot all your 3D with the same, so especially otherwise you'll have sort of depth adjustment problem on the surrounding of your picture. Probably be okay in the center, but uh, in the surrounding of the picture when the keystoning happen, which sort of slightly scale one eye compared to the other, you need your CG to do the same, otherwise things will misalign. Yeah. 